a good day to all so let us start with the sessions of anatomy to begin with with the introduction to anatomy more so knowing a bit of the history of anatomy before the introduction so first basically what is anatomy it is a science which deals with structure of the body from macroscopic to the microscopic level and this anatomy has long been studied through the dissections on cadavers and they used to preserve those dissected parts which has come forth in writing many literatures and uh, textbooks in very very good old days and that served as a basic for understanding the structure and functions of the human body earlier the human anatomy was just a descriptive science primarily concerned by identifying and naming the body structures but today the importance of anatomy lies in its functional approach and its clinical applications so this is now considered as the practical applied science that forms the firm foundation for the practice of medicine tomorrow so the word anatomy is derived from the greek which means to cut up or to cut open its equivalent in the latin means dissect which is more frequently used term so basically most of the terminology of anatomy hails from greek and latin words because for example let us take the thigh bone which is called as femur so the thigh bone is known as femur even in china even in russia even in any of the other countries in the world so this greek and latin terminology of anatomy is accepted worldwide whatever may be the language but in that language also femur is femur so that's how uh, the terminology has to be worldwide in anatomy let us have a sneak peek through the history of anatomy so anatomy is regarded as the oldest scientific discipline of medicine the first documented scientific dissections on human body are carried way back from 3rd century onwards in egypt that is in alexandria so this is a picture of the anatomy theater those days where the dissections were done very haphazardly because the literature what was available those days was very minimal by their peers who have done that so there's a person who will be reading the literature which is as much as available and the others going ahead doing the dissection and you can see how the instruments in those days are used they used to be very crude uh, way of doing dissections with uh, very rude instruments those days so that's how the dissections those days were carried along and then came galen a physician in ancient greece who has done and documented his dissected works and published the literature also which dominated and influenced the medical science for over 1000 years that period of time was also known as galenic age where his literature was practiced all through 
these years and all these uh, literatures and all they were written on a very thin leafy papery structure which is called as papyrus like the way you might have heard that tala patra grandas which was in mythology where our good old and uh, mythological things and all were written in on those palm leaves actually they are so they are called as tala patra grandalu so that's how even in egyptian days the literature was preserved by writing on a you can see very thin papery structure which is called as papyrus an ancient medical egyptian text that has come out which is known as surgical papyrus the name for the literature was given as surgical papyrus and that has been a manual of military surgery which described about 48 cases of injuries fractures wounds dislocations and tumors which were all the work that was done on the soldiers who were injured in the war basically so that after treating them by giving the first aid and the procedures that were done on them they came to a conclusion that this is how a fracture has to be reduced this is how the wounds should be treated so all those things were encrypted on the surgical papyrus textbook which was then followed on and most as i said the nomenclature the methods and application for the study of anatomy all date very very back to the greek time much on to the 3rd and 4th centuries and the terminology also was mostly in greek then in 4th century bc the use of human cadavers for anatomical research purpose was started which was started by the herophilus who was also an anatomist and he even done vivisections which means that dissections done on living people by getting permission from then king of alexandria of egypt and uh, these uh, living persons were taken as the prisoners who were given life sentence so at the end of their life sentence they were taken and these uh, vivisections were performed on them he was so particular in doing that to know about the living nature of the tissues and the relations the mobility of the tissues the texture of the tissues and all that because once the person is dead because of the rigor mortis the texture of the living tissues alter and he again uh, depicted all his work as a literature which was then followed on so is the reason herophilus was known as father of anatomy and this is how the dissections the anatomical theaters those days were done because it was the cadavers were very less and the vivisections were very very limited which were done and was viewed like this they are called as anatomical theaters which have been started then and in early 16th century also then came the hippocrates you are all very familiar with the word who is known as father of medicine and founder of anatomy also and there was another person who was called aristotle who was also an anatomist a physician those days he was called as father of comparative anatomy because he has done more of his research work the dissections on quite number of animals mainly the pigs goats and all which have near normal near similar structures as uh, the human beings so he then compared how the heart is the morphology the functioning and everything of 
heart of the pig and the human being and he came out with the evolved structures so evolutionary anatomy also was being done bit by aristotle then long long ago so he started comparing the animal anatomy with the human anatomy to know about the evolution how the organs have developed and all that so that is the reason aristotle was known as uh, father of comparative anatomy so more about uh, the hippocrates to know is he is a very famous greek physician who was regarded as father of uh, medicine where his name is memorized in the hippocratic oath which the graduating students take before entering into the medical practice though hippocrates had a limited exposure to human dissection he proclaimed that four elements of the body fluids form the pathologic and physiological basis of health and disease okay so a healthy person was taught to have the balance of all these four fluids which is very necessary for him to be healthy so the medical thought for over 2000 years went on with the same hypothesis of the hippocrates and he was the first person also in the greek medicine to say that the disease was not caused by gods that is the displeasure of gods or spirits but was the result of the natural cause which became the beginning of the present day scientific medicine so his work the hippocrates work was attributed to the body of writing and he also has uh, made a book which is called as hippocratic corpus which is a collection of roughly 70 works of his and is the oldest surviving complete medical book so when we look at the instruments that were used for dissection say or doing any procedures on the human beings and all this is how the instruments were very very rude instruments because they were just coming to know by doing what which can be used for this purpose and that purpose so this is how you can see the scalpels how big they are so all these are the tools that were used by the ancient greeks and this hippocratic oath was in the form of a cross you can see that so the hippocratic oath what we all take is just a very little part of the main oath that came into force from 12th century onwards Uh, you can see a procedure here which has been done he is the person who has got injured probably the dislocation of the shoulder so get it right he was put on a wooden plank wooden board and the person here is literally pulling the hand and this person is pulling the person on to the other way around so that's how the procedures for treatment and all started by the hippocrates and this device was very um, frequently and constantly used for quite some time to come to reduce these uh, dislocations of the shoulder which came up with a name as hippocratic device so and another thing is a person who is a very chain smoker or a person who is having the lung diseases had a very very less percentage of oxygen that is flowing in the blood 
which will cause the clubbing of the fingers you can see here the nails are rounded up here and uh, they are not the usual set. they are like clubs isn't it so club you all know right probably this is how the club will be so this is how the round thing here that happened so that is how it is called as clubbing of nails that is usually seen in these uh, lung related problem patients so even today when you go to your clinics if you find somebody having this clubbing of nails or clubbing fingers then he definitely has an underlying lung disease that's how you can even make out physical appearance of few of the organs signs and symptoms you call that as those things so they are also called as hippocratic fingers so now coming to the 14th century where the leonardo da vinci you are all familiar again with this word so he is mostly known for his work in art and technology and began a series of anatomical drawings depicting an ideal human form by conducting way, way many of dissections and he used to preserve those dissections which he has conducted as models he has kept and then he has published almost as about 60 books of his literature with these these are all pen drawings that he has done so he is a very good artist and uh, he is a well known painter sculptor architect musician and an anatomist as well one of the famous uh, artwork of the leonardo da vinci is vitruvian man this vitruvian man shows the proportions of the human body which is one of the very famous drawings of leonardo da vinci and not to forget about the mona lisa painting so which has become a world famous painting so you all know that the mona lisa doesn't have eyebrows right why doesn't she have eyebrows in the painting so that has to be come back from you so just get back to me with that answer and uh, this is how he has depicted a uh, plenty number of uh, drawings showing the various muscles their structure their relation to the other structures from where till where they are extending and few of the procedures also and this is another architect being an architect he has designed a very very huge bridge that time when italy has been drowned very badly and a very horrible flood he has done this uh, bridge to save the public of uh, italy and he was very much praised by that king also so coming back to our anatomy aspect so to get these wonderful paintings he has done dissections on plenty number of cadavers how did they get them so what he used to do as in the night he used to climb the cemetery walls dug up the graves steal bodies and put them in his studio dissect them and then he used to have them as models for his sculptures he is a sculptor also so he used to make models and sculptures out of the dissected work what he has done then everyone in the place there started complaining about the missing people he even that thing goes that they were even uh, murdering people was done to gain the bodies for dissection 
So then uh, there was a lot many complaints that were coming up to the king that the bodies were missing this that and then the king then the pope Leo X ordered that the dissections should not be done. He was forced to stop doing dissections on human specimens. So then came the act which is known as anatomy act. So that rule has given the name as anatomy act which means that whatever the body, the dead body is available, you cannot do dissection on it unless somebody is willing to donate their body for dissection or he, that person can do dissection of a dead body where nobody is there to claim that dead body as their relatives or known people. So such type of bodies are only allowed to be taken for dissection which is known as anatomy act. So because the killing of people was going on a higher end because whoever has given bodies they might be getting few of the amount so it's what it has become like a survival for them doing the wrong thing so that's how the anatomy act has came into force so he has done about 750 drawings representing the studies of bone skin muscles and the relations of all these structures and the internal organs, their relations, their blood supply, everything and published the book which was the first illustrated textbook of anatomy. Then came the Andreas Vesalius who was known as father of modern anatomy where he, his work to the human anatomy was immeasurable and he worked as professor of anatomy in university in Italy. So there he performed human dissections and initiated the use of live models to determine the surface landmark for internal structures. So that's how the surface anatomy has surfaced in the anatomy where you can percuss or palpate certain structures which are underneath the skin by taking few of the landmarks. So that is called as surface anatomy. That's how he is known as father of uh, modern anatomy and uh, laid the foundation on which advances in medicine and surgery took place for years together. And that's how the Vesalius has reformed the anatomy. So he was also known as reformer of anatomy. There was another person, Fregnot. He rendered his services doing anatomical specimens into everlasting pieces of art. So till that time, whatever the dissections that were done were preserved which used to decompose over a period of time. So he didn't want it to have that for whatever the work he has done in the field of anatomy. Then he thought and injected the colored wax that hardens inside the blood vessels. The remaining tissues they get dried up and is treated with varnish. He used to varnish whatever he has preserved and such type of plenty number of anatomical specimens were done by Fregnard and he displayed them in the National Museum in Paris. He also in 18th century around did the first whole body specimens which were preserved lifelong where these body specimens 
were dried and varnished before that these specimens they contain metal alloys which were melted and injected into arteries while still they are in a hot liquid state so that's how the metal infused uh, specimens were pre preserved till date so all these things which were about 200 to 250 years back they were all still displayed in the national museum and the palace then during 19th century in egypt mummifying of the bodies was their custom where they will be preserving them with all food items and other accessories inside the pyramids isn't it so when this mummification is being done they came to know that the putrefiable organs that means the organs which get destroyed earlier has to be taken out from the body so the structures the all hollow structures like stomach intestines they used to pull them off from the body giving a small neck onto the body not cutting the whole of the body so that's how the putrefiable organs were taken off and the non putrefiable organs which are the solid structures like kidney liver they were retained back so then they used to inject all the preservative fluids into it and the body they used to put in the red hot sun outside for few days to mummify so that's how they used to mummify the body and then store them in these corpse boxes and put them inside the pyramids which has given way to the procedure which is called as embalming that is introducing the formalin into the cadaver for its preservation for quite a long time for much of years to come which is what is practiced now in most of the medical schools so during 19th century this particular aspect has led to the anatomical research and extended with histology and developmental biology of both humans and animals because comparative anatomy was all already existing then so even the cut sections of the tissues of the body they were stored in these uh, preserving fluids those days and then they were observed under the slides so even the microscope was the thing that has been uh, invented by them the microscope then in 19th century came this person who is gunther von hugens he was popularized by making plastinated specimens for his dissecting work plastination is a very costly process where the technique is where they preserve the bodies or any of the body parts by replacing the body fluids by plastics that is the plastic polymer is injected into the body and that replaces the biological fluids within the body so that the specimens they do not smell or decay and they can be touched they won't be wet so that's how 
the plastination is being done and that is going to preserve these sort of the work the dissected work or the specimens for quite quite lot lot many years to come so during the plastination procedure the positioning of the dissected cadaver or the structure can be done accordingly you can see here and here so these are all the plastinated uh, specimens which were done and uh, dissection and then going ahead doing plastination requires about one year time to complete and he has done about few hundreds and hundreds of such type of specimens where he started his first plastinated specimen in 1977 in an animal and then went ahead doing an all the cadavers and preserving them and all these uh, plastinated specimens were put up in a permanent body worlds museum which is in london it is an amazing thing to see there so that's how uh, his work is being displayed to the whole world and he passed away in 2012 so he wanted his wife to do plastination of his body and to preserve in the same museum his wife also is an anatomist and is well versed with the plastination process so often it so happens that the anatomical structures or diseases were named by the person who has found them just to name a very few i have put down few of the terminology where you are little well versed with which you have come across in your intermediate so the antonio scarpa is the first person to come along seeing with the scarpa's fascia which is a fascia on the anterior abdominal wall the superficial fascia corti is the one first person to see the organ of corti and that is named by his name filippino pacini is the pacinian corpuscles which are present in the skin which are the pressure corpuscles and camillo golgi is the golgi apparatus johann frederick meckel is first one to see the meckel's diverticulum which is an embryological abnormality and leopold outback as the outback plexus which are the nerve plexus that are present in the wall of the gastrointestinal tract george mesner also has found the mesner's plexus which are the plexus in the walls of the uh, git that is the gastrointestinal tract alfred wokman he was the one to coin the name for the wokman's canals which are the horizontal canals connecting the haversian canals in the bone and thoms willis has coined first person to see the circle of willis which is the main blood supply to the brain the brain stem and then charles bell has first person to see the symptoms of the facial palsy which is called as bell's palsy you now oh to fall this there was an indian too who was a renowned surgeon way back in 1930 where he is called as dr seshar chalam he is dr t seshar chalam he is surgeon by profession and uh, he has seen while performing his surgeries that there is another artery which is supplying the appendix along with the appendicular artery 
and coined that artery as artery of sesha chalam which is nothing but the accessory appendicular artery so that's a pride moment for all of us indians also he has made way into all these persons list so next is sir henry gray who is a renowned anatomist who published his book the first anatomical book followed like the bible for anatomy the first book what he published was anatomy descriptive and surgical which revealed the depths of human anatomy region wise system wise every bit of the human body is been depicted in this book and is known as gray's anatomy he published this book way back in 1858 then he is sir henry gray and then this book got modified modified condensed condensed and came as gray's anatomy for students now 